Had this symposium been organized 30 years earlier, it might have been called the discourse of the couple, the ideology of the couple, or the construction of the couple. These days, however, ontology seems to have taken the place of these more culturally attentive words, signaling a widespread turn away from epistemology, language, and history towards metaphysic, speculative philosophy, and materiality. We shall try to convince you in what follows that we have a more specific application of ontology in mind, and that there is a reason, other than timeliness or trendiness, that we couple the couple with this loaded term, heavy with the legacy of first philosophy and the history of Western metaphysics. While ontology and history are traditionally conceived as oppositional domains, we instead understand them as entangled in what Michel Foucault once called the historical a priori. A historical a priori is a function which determines what is possible in a given moment and yet remains untaught and unthinkable. The ontology of the couple can thus be conceived as a response to Foucault's call for what he refers to as a critical ontology of ourselves. And here I quote Foucault. The critical ontology of ourselves must be considered not, certainly, as a theory or a, doc or a doctrine. It must be conceived as an attitude, an ethos, a philosophical life in which the critique of what we are consists in the historical analysis of the limits imposed on us, as well as in an experiment with the possibility of going beyond them." End of quotation. The ontology of the couple thus refers to something which is at the same time praxis, for instance, the historically and culturally variable practices of coupling, and the conditions of possibilities, of possibility for that praxis to emerge, the a priori, which indicates the impulse to form and be in couples across time and space. Understood in this way, the ontology of the couple is a formulation less interested to interrogate the couple as a metaphysical or transcendental category to be affirmed or opposed than to examine the different practices and impulses that underlie the repetition compulsion to forming, deforming, and dissolving dyadic bonds. In other words, what ontological inquiry poses for us is not necessarily a critique, an affirmation, or a deconstruction of the couple, but a question about the limits and the infinitude of this most minimal form of relationality. Going back to Foucault, what, is, what his call for a critical ontology of ourselves instigates is a pressure to think beyond the ontological limit point of what is currently thinkable. In our case, the constituted couple, which even non-monogamous relational forms like polyamory seems merely to replicate, multiply, and expand. And yet, against Foucault, this critical ontology of ourselves could perhaps be imagined not, as it seems to imply, as an attempt to expand the ontological perimeter of the thinkable to encompass the as yet unthinkable, for example, the extension of heterosexual modes of relationality to homosexual pairs. Rather, more in the manner of Adorno's negative dialectics, we might try to accept the intractability of what still lays untranslated beyond such limits, and thus allow it to remain ontologically untransposable and untranslatable. The aim here would be that of deactivating the ontological apparatus rather than continuously trying to stretch its all too flexible limits. But why must ontology always be conceived of as a limit? Feminist philosophers of science and science studies scholars of late 
have contested the framing of ontology as a philosophy of limits, as if ontology were the genotype to culture's phenotype. That is, as if ontology named the given and predetermined part of being, and epistemology named how being gets transformed through encounters with subjects. Is not ontology a science of potentiality as well as limitation, a philosophy of encounters as well as structures? In an interview on Spinoza, the philosopher Elizabeth Gross writes that ontology entails, quote, a manner in which to live, a capacity to enhance or diminish oneself through encounters. Ontology, in other words, always entails ethics. And for Spinoza, ethics was about relationality. Good and bad are for Spinoza nothing but measures of the effect of encounters. Encounters that enhance beings he calls good, and encounters that diminish them he calls bad. Following Spinoza, instead of asking what has made the couple possible, we ask what the couple makes possible. Rather than, say, tracing the historical emergence of the couple form, rather than asking how subjects have been disciplined to desire this power-laden relational structure, we ask to what extent and in what circumstances the couple form enhances or diminishes beings. Indeed, despite its seemingly rigid and symmetrical form, its one plus oneness, the couple is a topology that moves, a form held onto because it proposes something, tells a story that gets one somewhere. Where exactly the narrative of the couple leads seems here far less important than the fact that one is going and going with someone. <laughs> How is this seemingly static form able to produce so much momentum? Put otherwise, how is, it that the, how is it that the couple can engender so much optimism when one's experience of it in the present is often that of cruelty? In order to answer such questions, we propose, one must increase one's attention to form. This is because the ontology of the couple is a form, perhaps a deeply narrative form, the content of which is often irrelevant. It concerns not the specific qualities of a love object, their gender, for example, but the shape of one's relation to them. The ontology of the couple is thus about whomever. This is evidenced in the fact that, historically, if one loses one, that one is, more often than not, replaced by another one. In mapping the ontology of the couple, we thus set out to interrogate what we call the couple's formalism, the having and holding onto promising structures, not because of what they promise, but because they do the promising. To undertake the ontology of the couple is to ask the age-old question of Western metaphysics. What is? What is a couple? Let us consider briefly the grammar of this phrase. Normally, a couple is made of two individuals, be it a romantic sexual couple, twins, or me and my dog. And yet, the couple demands a grammatical third person singular to be spoken as one. The couple is, the couple never are. This normative grammatical technicality seems to suggest that when we ask, what is the couple, or answer, the couple is, we're talking about a ontology. Yet, as we all know, without the need to paraphrase irregularize le sexe qui n'en est pas un, the couple is not one. Instead of asking why one plus one equals two, an impossible task for us, given that we are really not mathematicians, we want to know how to get to the ones that are said to be added together to form the couple which is. We ask, what is it about the couple form in all its multiplicity that produces the individual and the 
illusion of the I. The ontology of the one that is, in reality, never just one. One ontology of the couple intuits that the couple relies on and also produces a notion of the self-enclosed ones, the ones that, are, that allegedly form the rigid two, the couple that is. At the same time, the couple threatens to become and is perhaps perhaps forever haunted by the more than just two, the affair, the ex, the second husband, the aunt, the sister-in-law, the child, the co-organizer. <laughs> what we learn from the mon monist, the Taoist, the feminist, and the queer is that the one is not one. I am large, I contain multitudes, says Whitman or if that is too macho, almost imperial, and at the same time pushy and bottom. Emily, Dick, Emily Dickinson, in a marvelously queer way, has it, and truth so manifold. The ontology of the couple is about the numerological malleability that oscillates between the one that shrinks yet also expands and the three that expands, yet also annihilates. As in the old Laozi, there interbecomes the Tao, the one, the two, the three, and the many. Can we say that the ontology of the couple insists upon the too much and too little of the one? On the one hand, the couple contains multiple ones, almost a baroque plurisingular. On the other hand, the couple threatens to consume the ones into a rigid oneness, the cannibalistic devouring of the other in one, or anyone who would complain, I feel like my sense of self is totally lost in this relationship. The flip side of the Baroquesque, one that is many, is an anthropophagic collapsing into the void. The singular one, devoid of relationality, that no matter how hard we try to multiply it, stays void and one. The grave cannot become the rectum. The ontology of the couple, the infinite play of the one, two, one many, we hope, will be able to address the old debates in queer theory between similarly antagonistic, nevertheless coupled pairs. Minoritizing versus universalizing, West versus non-West, antinormativity versus without antinormativity, futurity versus no future. So let's ask bluntly at this moment, what are the couple? 